Akshita, you can start now. A very good evening to all. I, Dr. Akshita Gupta and Dr. Ms. Bakadi will be the moderators for today's session. We welcome you all to Sinodin Indian Society of Dentistry webinar series 2023. Theme is Unlocking Trends in Dentistry. For today's second session, we have with us Dr. Pooja Sabarwal, ma'am, BDS, MDS, Periodontics and Preventive Dentistry. Ma'am is certified hypnotherapist from American Hypnosis Association. She is currently heading the Department of Dentistry at Madhuka Rainbow Children's Hospital. And her topic for presentation is Hypnosedation in Dentistry. I would like to request ma'am to please start with her presentation. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm evening to everyone tuned in this Sunday for the topic Hypnosedation in Dentistry. Um, so we'll get started. Um, okay, so I'll begin with a video which shows a brief clipping of hypnosis in my dental clinic. Just a second. So, okay. So the video that we just saw was that of an arm raising induction in an 11 year old boy, which was made after uh, due consent. And this video uses uh, hypnosis while giving local anesthesia injection. This was given to a child with dental trauma. And as we can see that uh, it creates a sense of such dissociation that when he is asked after the injection shot, what he was doing and where he was in his mind, he's able to correlate having a flavor of uh, you know chocolate ice cream on the beach and the weather being windy. So what is hypnosis? Hypnosis is a state that resembles sleep that is introduced by the hypnotist by means of uh, suggestions which are readily and easily accepted by the person under hypnosis. But is the person really asleep under hypnosis? Um, that is a question which I expect all of you will clear out by the end of this session. Hypnosis, like all sciences, bears its origin amidst mystery and superstition. It has undergone a period of great rejection and acceptance over and over various centuries. So, um, you know, in history, it's, it bears its origin in France and a lot of uh, opposition was faced by hypnosis um, at the time of, uh, you know, the King Louis XVI, where it was banned at a certain point in time. Mesmer describes hypnosis as a form of magnetism, whereas Dr. Lewis K. Boswell says that it is an unusual state of mind where the mind is so consistently focused on immediate thoughts or events that it disregards all surrounding stimuli. Brian Williams describes hypnosis to have both two things, a central focus of attention and a surrounding sense of dissociation or inhibition. So one of the most misconceptions about hypnosis is that the consciousness of the subject is lost. We believe that we will lo lose control when under hypnosis and lose our sense of uh, reality or perspective to make our own decisions. However, this is very much untrue. At each stage, the person has a full awareness of uh, what is going on and in the surroundings. In fact, the person is so deeply focused upon the suggestions of the operator that they are at a higher productivity level to carry out day-to-day -day activity. Greater the depth, more is the awareness and greater is the focus onto the suggestions. 
So therefore, hypnosis is a heightened state of accept uh, acceptability to suggestions, suggestibility and responsivity to the operator's directions. So as we were talking about the history of hypnosis and it bearing uh, multiple acceptances and rejections over the cycle of centuries, hypnosis has been a part of multiple cultures over time, wherein, um, you know, it uh, bears its origin to the Greek mythology, wherein the Greek temples, as early as, uh, uh, you know, 2000 years ago, hypnosis was used in Greek temples for sleep. So there were priests who would put the person to sleep and then create a sense of healing. Franz Anton Mesmer described it as a phenomenon of magnetism, where he says that uh, with the help of certain objects, suggestions, certain uh, voice commands, he was able to create this dynamic sense of stimuli, wherein the blood flow was altered. And this was basically because of increased oxygenation and separation of the uh, tissue capillaries. And this increases the receptivity of the body to outside stimuli and suggestion and alters the energy sense in the body. <clears throat> As we can see in this flow diagram, about 5,000 years ago, Egypt's old kingdoms and the temple of Aimohep, the individual expectations and sensory overloads were used to heal in these temples. Then this is a picture which is demonstrating hypnosis as early as the 6th century BC in the Oracle, where the Oracle at Delphi is using hypnosis as a form of healing. Then, 1770s, moving on to Franz Anton Mesmer, where uh, popularly he used hypnosis in two schools, that is the Nancy and the Charcot School in Paris, where King Louis XVI uh, actually put it to court's uh, you know, decision whether hypnosis was fact or fiction. However, unfortunately, hypnosis was disregarded in the course of, in the court of Louis XVI. Then the um, European surgeon James Braid was actually a neurophysician and he actually was the father of modern hypnosis where he used it as a curative remedy in various disorders. Then we have Jean Martin Charcot, who was the first person who gave the um, description of acute myeloid leukemia and multiple sclerosis. He was a famous neurologist who uh, gave good studies and good reviews about hypnosis as a popular Sigmund fluid in the field of dentistry and psychology. He also worked closely with uh, hypnosis before he moved on to dream therapy and other modernistic psychological uh, treatments. As of today, in 1955, the British Medical Association approved the practice of hypnosis to treat various psychoneurosis as well as in the areas of childbirth and surgery. In 1958, the American Medical Association approved hypnosis by highlighting the medical uses, uh, which is, uh, you know, as much as 60 years ago and the american psychiatric association just two years later that is the year 1960 approved hypnosis as a branch of psychology therefore moving into present century hypnosis has obtained a respectable position as a powerful therapeutic tool which we will see ahead as per various literature so how hypnosis works in a nutshell is beyond the uh, scope of this very small webinar. But for those of you who are interested, we can you can definitely feel free to reach out to me and we can study hypnosis in great depth together. So the mind is divided into two parts, the conscious mind, which is only about 12% of what we are thinking and analyzing right now. The way I'm giving this presentation and talking to all of you and you're absorbing it, reflects the 12% of the conscious mind that we are using. So this is as simple as using social media or scrolling through your mobile phones. Then we have the subconscious mind, which is the remaining 88% of the mind's uh, you know, matter. This deals with long-term memory, some emotions, feelings, well-being, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, and all bodies' involuntary activity and function. As we can see in this model, the size of the subconscious mind is much greater compared to the size of the subconscious mind. There exists a critical filter that is reflected as a critical mind between the conscious and the subconscious mind. Now, whenever there is enough message units in the environment, there is a breach between the conscious and the subconscious mind, which allows us to enter the subconscious, and that is where hypnosis takes its root. This happens subconsciously during sleep 
under the influence of alcohol, certain drugs, when our body goes without sleep for 24 hours, that's when the critical filter naturally breaches. Hypnosis by the means of certain techniques and certain scripts, verbal commands, sometimes audio, sometimes kinesthetic concepts, creates a breach between this conscious and the subconscious mind to actually be used as a therapy, which targets the greater half of the mind, which cannot be seen and targeted normally. Applications of hypnosis today in the medical field after its approval by the British and the American Med uh, Medical Association and the British Medical Association have been diverse. So <clears throat> this is a review that was published at our department. It states the conceptual review of hypnosis in pre-treatment anxiety management in dental settings, which was basically done comparing hypnosis and progressive muscle relaxation, but it also reviews hypnosis in a variety of fields which are medical and allied. So since the year 1990, as we can see, it's being used to control and reduce blood pressure. 1991, it is being used to help head and neck cancer surgery patients. In the year 1997, for perioperative discomfort in patients, the reduction of renal and vascular procedures and the discomfort associated with such procedures has also been done with hypnosis by Lang et al. in 2000. Then there's lots of studies for hypnosis being used to aid patients with chronic dyspnea, to help with preoperative anxiety and also help in pediatric cancer patients who routinely receive lumbar punctures. So as for the dental um, applications, we'll move slowly towards them. So uh, dental anxiety is a problem that we commonly struggle with throughout the globe. The UK National Health Survey shows that there's 36% patients with severe and significant anxiety, while United States also shows a significant percentage of patients battling with severe anxiety. And as far as India is concerned, uh, we have a study in which 82% of Indian pediatric patients were found to be scared of the tooth extraction procedure. So therefore, anxiety remains an ongoing battle, especially for us as pediatric dentists and I guess even general dentists alike, where there's phobic patients and we're dealing with uh, human minds. Anxiety proves to be a very uh, common day-to-day -day battle that we face as dentists. The baloney phobia of fear of injections and needles is common in both medical and dental settings alike. Local anesthesia, the injection which is commonly given to prevent pain, unfortunately becomes a barrier to oral and general care. Many times I have parents of pediatric patients who come to me saying that they have been differing or you know avoiding dental appointments because they are so scared to visit the dentist. Electronic and computer anesthesia has come up, but it is not very practical in Indian settings because of the cost and limitations to routine outpatient settings. The risk and benefit ratio of any technique, be it pharmacological or non-pharmacological, because we will also be going on to sedation by the end of this presentation, so needs to be assessed. So there are some innovative non-pharmacological aids like the Buzzy system, which is a frozen pack, which can be used to help the help in distraction with the pain, the gate control theory of pain. Of course, as pediatric dentists, we commonly use tend, tend love and care, tell play do, tell show do, and such cognitive aids to help. Audio-visual distraction proves to be very useful, which I use in a day-to-day -day basis with children and adults alike. Nitrous oxide is another popular tool. Then for patients who are not responding to nitrous, we commonly work under deep sedation. And then when all of that fails, um, I think every week almost we have a case which every week to two weekly goes under general anesthesia. Uh, applications of hypnosis in dentistry. To lower the pain and the need for analgesics in third molar extraction, improve the patient compliance towards oral surgery. As we can see, all of these are usually function towards you know, the fear of tooth extraction and baloney phobia as we are discussing. Reduced recovery time in oral surgery, anxiety and pain reduction in dental extraction procedure, pain control. There is one study in 2008 which uh, studies the compliance of myofunctional appliance wear with and without hypnosis, where they found that the hypnotized subjects and the children and adolescents were wearing their appliances 
more uh, consistently. There's mostly anxiety reduction during the tooth removal procedure. Similar to this is our study published in European Archives of Pediatric Dentistry. This was a randomized control trial which shows that hypnosis and progressive muscle relaxation, which is um, an allied technique given by Jacobson in Harvard in the year 1908, both of these techniques were found to be useful in reducing the anxiety and pain in 8 to 12 year old patients undergoing the tooth extraction procedure to the point that even the painkiller that we take post extraction, the children who were undergoing hypnosis were found to require this lesser compared to the children who were without hypnosis. So this is the uh, summary of the study findings which I discussed. And these are the other uses of hypnosis, of which some uses can be therapeutic and others can be operative. So operative uses include analgesia during surgery, which we discussed, the control of hemorrhage and salivary blood flow, faster post-op recovery from pain and uh, other uh, symptoms. The therapeutic uses include the management of dental phobia and anxiety, management of severe gag reflex, which I think I have used countless times in patients who are, have uh, many times the children and adults alike have a tendency to gag, especially while they're taking alginate impressions. So I think if you use some rapid hypnosis techniques with those patients at the right time, then they will respond pretty well. Benign chronic orofacial pain, locking of the temporomandibular joint. I think um, I've also used hypnosis in more than five to six patients where they've come with an acute locking and reduction in mouth opening, post-temporomandibular joint and disc derangement disorders. And uh, these children and adults, mostly teenagers, have benefited alike from hypnosis and relaxation strategies. And gradually, the mouth opening has increased and symptoms have allayed with time. The adaptation to dentures and behavior modifications such as thumb sucking and, you know, quitting habits like nail biting, which require a strategy which requires persistent growth with the patient and, you know, working with families. Hypnosis also benefits such patients. Now, these are some of the techniques <clears throat> which are summarized below where the scripts for hypnosis are described in a very brief but effective manner as a summary for this brief overview presentation. So uh, first we have relaxation with guided imagery. In this technique, we will tell the patient to relax all the body parts going from the top of the head till the tip of the toes or from the bottom to the top going from the uh, tip of the toes to the top of the head. This is followed by asking the patient to focus upon any relaxing place or environment. Very importantly, when we are using guided imagery, the choice of imagery should be approved from the patient prior to going into the imagery pattern. Commonly, everyone finds the beach waves relaxing. Sometimes children may enjoy a garden, a birthday party, or a festival or a carnival, but the choice can be customized for the patient as you practice it more and more. Somatic awareness or mindfulness induction includes bringing the awareness of the patient to multiple senses, like drawing the attention to the breathing, feeling the palm of the hand resting on the lap, the thoughts coming through the brain in the present moment, and focusing on all sounds around you. Then the eye roll induction, this is very effective with children. This includes looking up at the index finger and drawing the finger closer and closer, allowing the eyes to shut and relax the muscles around the eyes. Bead and crystal guided is a very fun way. Commonly, we can use this in children and adults alike. We can first tell them to weave a necklace made out of colorful beads, crystals, uh, even a do-at-home bead set. And then gradually use it as a motion pendulum and focus on the shade, hue, chroma, and motion of any one of the beads till they gradually focus their gaze on one point and allow the eyes to shut. Now, this illustration was taken from a review article by Finkelstein, but all of these inductions are very good and quick inductions to be used in the dental setting. The one that we showed on the video was an arm raising induction. That is a typical induction which is used in a psychiatrist's office, but it is usually time consuming and it requires about 10 to 15 minutes. But most of these inductions are quick enough to work in the span of two, five to seven minutes, depending on the suggestibility of the patient you're working with. <clears throat> now, this is a couple of videos falling through. This is a small child.
So this is a patient, she is a four plus turning five and we've given her an inferior alveolar nerve block uh, while using progressive muscle relaxation and guided imagery as um, a hypnotic induction. Now this is hypnosis, a brief clipping of a three-year-old under hypnosis. I've showed some of the youngest people, I think it's three, this would be uh, three years, four months would be the earliest age, but the child has cognition enough to follow through on instruction to get hypnotized. So... So she's having some strip crowns bonded. Now, after we've discussed hypnosis and what it can do and that we've seen that there's a lot of research which backs it up, it's time to delve right into the sedation continuum and go deeper into the realms of what sedation and other drugs can do in the field of dentistry. So, the first and the most common form of sedation is sedation, where just by the behavior, the ambience of the operatory, the operator and the team's functioning, the patient is getting sedated without any knowledge of the operator and the team. The second level of sedation is minimal sedation, where the patient is still very much in charge of the verbal commands, the airway and the cardiovascular functioning. Then we move on to moderate sedation or conscious sedation. The AAPD as well as the American Dental Association permit us as dentists to practice between minimal to moderate sedation very carefully around the moderate parameter because we need to have a lot of airway control and equipment available to resuscitate the patient if they are practicing moderate sedation. So nitrous oxide up until the range of 50% usually goes under minimal sedation, which is something that we commonly use as pediatric dentists. Then there are forms of deep sedation and general anesthesia, which is crossing the red line. That means that these should only be practiced in the presence of an anesthesia team where tracheal intubation can be practiced. Now, uh, my practice of dentistry includes working commonly and closely with deep sedation and general anesthesia also. Therefore, I cover this as a part of this presentation. Local anesthesia can be given in the range of minimal to moderate conscious sedation. Now, our responsiveness levels, as we discussed, as we are going from minimal to general anesthesia, gradually the patient is losing control of the responsiveness, airway, spontaneous ventilation, and the cardiovascular functions alike. So, Corti et al. have given the best practice guidelines for sedation. This is in coalition with the AAP and AAPD. For all those young dentists who are going to be practicing sedation and using drugs, I recommend all of you to go over these guidelines um, as a guide to know what all are the safety precautions to have in your practice before we go for such forms of sedation? The goals of sedation are to maintain a cooperative state of the patient. Now, obviously, we will to go from the cognitive strategies to the drug-based strategies only when the cognition fails. Or sometimes, I think in my case, when the patients are traveling in a very short duration of time, the preference is going more towards the drugs. We also have to, uh, you know, sort of in infer and incorporate the parental and the family um, perspective and dynamic in each situation because some of them may be amenable to a lot of non-pharmacological strategies and coming and going multiple times whereas the other end of the extreme may not be um, you know comfortable with multiple visits and they will want a quick fix that you do everything in one go and then we can keep coming for the follow-ups as and when required so I think we need to assess that and uh, as pediatric dentists and dentists, we need to um, incorporate the patient's informed consent and will at all times. So um, the goals of sedation are to maintain the state of cooperation so that the patient can receive treatment both safely and successfully, ensure that they are safe at all times, control their movement, maintain cardiovascular and respiratory stability at all times. And of course, what we are doing it for to eliminate any pain and minimize dental anxiety. Pre-sedation phase is very important. We need to assess, like I said, the patient factors, their preference, and the procedural factors. What is the duration of the procedure? And many times, if we have to do more than six teeth, I would prefer to go for 
uh, general anesthesia compared to sedation. But uh, then again, if the patient is coming multiple times, I'll, I do a lot of full mouth cases without any drugs. And uh, where the patient and the family are comfortable, we would just go for a non-pharmacological approach altogether. The provider factors, of course, whether I'm working in my clinic or whether I'm in the hospital, that also tends to vary. If I have a child who's, who has special needs and a medical history or even a healthy child who requires general anesthesia, I would tend to, um, you know, sort of refer to the hospital because there I know there's an ICU, there's an operation theater and there's a ventilator support, a pediatric ICU team and all the necessary neonatal and pediatric care available to take care of the child should an emergency exist. And I think we should always be equipped because forearmed, um, forewarned is forearmed. So, the patient factors also include the pre-anesthesia checkup, which is mandatory before practicing any forms of pharmacological sedation. Then comes the choice of the drugs. So I've covered a brief um, on all the drugs, the possibilities of drugs, which we commonly use as dentists. But many times in practice, I think a combination of these drugs is also chosen depending on the complexity of the case and also the cooperation of the child. So as I've shown you that basic minimal to moderate anxiety can be well managed with non-pharmacological strategies and hypnosis. So remember that the cases we are using with drugs are only the ones where anxiety is severe or where the preference of the patient is such to use drugs. I believe entirely in a minimally invasive form or approach towards dentistry or pediatric dentistry alike. And each of these drugs uh, should be used with great caution because they come with their own set of side effects. So benzodiazepines, commonly midazolam, is a water-soluble short-acting drug, which is two to three times more potent than diazepam. It is uh, one of the quickest forms of sedation, which can be used nowadays in the form of intranasal sprays, oral syrups, suspensions, and even intravenous sleep. And it has an affinity to the inhibitory neurotransmitter uh, GABA and its receptors. And it has an anti uh, antidote that is glumazenil available for reversal. So this is commonly the drug of choice. If I'm going for a short procedure under deep sedation, a special child, then uh, midazolam is used. Distribution half-life is quick, three to 10 minutes, and it is metabolized in the liver, excreted in the urine. The elimination half-life is also fairly quick. That is about two hours. It has a high therapeutic inde index and the dose required to produce the desired effect is considerably less. It does produce sedation, enzyolysis, and enterograde amnesia. That is, the patient will not have any bad memory of the procedure. And dose-dependent decrease in ventilation, decrease in BP, and muscle tone does exist with midazolam. So therefore, the dose has to be always titrated to the body weight of the child, whichever route we are using. We have to uh, carefully do the midazolam selection and um, dosing. Then there is propofol, which proves to be a great inducer. Commonly, we use propofol in the general anesthesia cases, but sometimes if you're using deep sedation and a difficult procedure, then propofol is also used. It's an alkyl phenyl derivative. It also has uh, enhancement of the GABA-A receptors. And it is an emulsion, which has the quickest, um, uh, you know, uh, the mode of action and the duration of action is only one arm brain circulation time that is 60 to 90 seconds and it's a great inducer because it recovers in two to three minutes it is a potential uh, potent sedative with an anti-emetic action there is no analgesia and there is pain on injection so sometimes they combine gaseous sedation with propofol as an inducer for general anesthesia ketamine has dissociative anesthesia which is caused by dissociation of the cerebral cortex cortex from the limbic system. It does cause sedation and amnesia. The airway reflexes remain intact with ketamine and it has an intense analgesic property also. It is great for asthmatic patients and those with respiratory distress because it has bronchodilator properties. So in children, commonly they come with enlarged adenoids, sometimes nasal airway obstructions. So ketamine is commonly used also. It causes an increase in heart rate, blood pressure, so it sort of negates the effect of the other drugs which are causing a depression. And it increases the intracranial and intraocular pressure. So in children who have a prosthetic eye lens or any procedure in the cornea, it should only be used with caution. It increases secretions and the chances of emesis. It has a high incidence of hallucinations and bad dreams. So also ketamine can be given in various routes as described. 
Then there is dexmedetomine, which is a relatively newer agent. It is a short-acting alpha-2 adrenergic receptor agonist, which produces sedation with moderate analgesia and anxiolysis. This is supposed to be a good drug from the anesthetist perspective. It has negligible depression of the respiratory overdrive and uh, causes bradycardia and hypotension, decreases chances of nausea and vomiting. So it has good share of advantages and is used commonly in the combination forms of sedation in these routes. Then fentanyl, um, uh, although this is used only in the presence of anesthetists, but it is used commonly as a short-acting opioid, which is highly lipid-soluble, produces analgesia as well as sedation. It is cardioprotective and can commonly be used intravenously. It has a set of side effects, but it also has um, an antagonist that is naloxone, which is used in case for reversal. Then nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a safe, effective analgesic and anxiolytic it is a colorless odorless gas which activates the GABA A receptors and the endogenous opioids. Nitrous oxide is one of the most popular tools with dentists, mostly pediatric dentists, because of its rapid uptake, recovery, and a very good potential of safety margin. The titration concentration should routinely not exceed 50%. And patient selection is also crucial. Many times I've, I have had patients who have had severe anxiety and they have tried nitrous failed and also have a very unpleasant memory of the experience because they've attempted some work under sedation which has failed. So therefore, nitrous should be used in Frankel 3-4, but with caution in patients exhibiting Frankel 2 and never in patients with Frankel 1 behavior because even if you're using rapid induction, there is a chance that nitrous may fail. So only after informing the parents that they want to try, should we use it in a severely anxious child because it will only have a potential or a line of safety towards mild to moderate anxiety. Fasting may be recommended up to two hours, but it's not compulsory as per the recent APD guidelines. The headache, nausea, vomiting are the most common adverse effects. Especially while we are working in the mouth, we should be careful that there's no aspiration of the vomitus and post-nitrous oxygenation and documentation must always be practiced. Now, these are some of the <clears throat> practical cases that I'm sharing. So this was a case of a three-year-old child who had severely anxious tranquil one behavior. Since I'm routinely working with the team of uh, trained pediatric anesthetists, this was done using a combination of midazolam, fentanyl, and ketamine. And um, this uh, used laser for the excision of the mucosal. And the child was absolutely comfortable throughout the procedure and had no memory. And this is done as a daycare procedure. So within 30 minutes to 40 minutes, uh, there's a complete recovery of the child. Only that much time is held with the anesthetist for observation. Immediate reversal is seen as early as two to three minutes because they are using reversal agents and the dose is titrated closely to the body weight and the age of the child. Now, this is another case where we've used general anesthesia in a three-year-old with special health care needs. Now, this child had ADHD, autism, which uh, we are realizing as pediatricians, pediatric dentists, neurologists that ADHD and autism is growing very much in frequency. Some blame it on the increasing screen time and others on the late age at which the childbirth takes place and a myriad of reasons why ADHD and autism is on the rise. So um, I think these kids, uh, especially uh, when they're coming with full mouth, uh, they benefit a lot, especially from an in total treatment in general anesthesia. And then thereafter, of course, any treatment you must explain to the patient would require periodic uh, maintenance, follow-ups, good home care, hygiene and preventive aid. So should be practiced thoroughly. Then uh, this is another case of a three-year-old who had cerebral palsy and uh, the child also had, she had good cognition actually and could have cooperated on the chair but she was undergoing uh, both leg surgeries and with the department of orthopedics and was also going to travel back to her hometown so the parents decided to go for general anesthesia because again it was a full mouth case now this is a uh, protective stabilization uh, under GA with an oral tube. Now, as dentists, we commonly should request for the nasal nasogastric tube to be placed, especially if the child has an airway which allows uh, so because it will give us a free mobility in the field of work but many times in, especially in cases of deviated nasal septum a recent cold flu increased adenoid size the anesthetist may prefer an oral tube which is be better for the safety of the child because it gives the anesthetist more room to work with so there I feel like I 
I work in a more constricted space, but I would always give the safety of the child an increased preference as an operator. So we would work around the oral tube with the mouth prop and some retraction suitably to, um, you know, best serve the child and they have a smooth recovery. Then, of course, post-operative monitoring and discharge is equally important. The anesthesia clearance post-op is required. Usually, they make sure that the child is feeding per oral, urinating normally, and the EVM scale is normal. That is the eyes, what, uh, voice, and motor skills. And basically, the child is active at the time of discharge. And always an emergency response contact point is given to these children with general anesthesia which is usually the team of anesthesia and emergency care unit at the hospital and a daycare discharge is planned such that the child has had the three or four or five hour procedure in the morning and is discharged by the evening on the same day. The requirement of training, this is a brief summary because we come to the end of the position um, uh, and the presentation. I want all of you to note the, that there is requirement of uh, good training and uh, leveling up the skill of uh, the emergency team and the resuscitation team should be compliant with the kind of case that we are taking up because uh, I feel as an operator and in the hospital settings I'm dealing with a lot more special health care needs compared to the kind of patients I'm dealing with at the clinic. As a single operator only, I can see the difference in the two setups. So in a hospital setup, many times we will have a patient referred from neurology who will have complex uh, special health care needs. Now, recently I've been referred an epileptic patient who has, um, you know, up to 15 to 20 seizures every day. So here the child is being referred already from three to four dental centers. So I feel like um, in such level of complexity of special health care needs, particularly we have to have a backup, which is equally trained. Procedural monitoring is absolutely mandatory. The drug selection has to be thorough and uh, long procedures in children with developmental disability um, in age less than six years commonly require deep sedation or general anesthesia. The guidelines also state that where possible, parental presence, hypnosis, distraction, topical anesthesia, electronic devices, AV distraction, guided imagery should be given preference over pharmacological aids. So um, therefore, we shouldn't be overly using the pharmacological aids also and the risk benefit ratio must always be studied. And another thing to note is that the children have the tendency to slip deeper. So practitioners should be trained to rescue the child from one level upwards. That is, if we are practicing minimal sedation as dentists, then all ability to resuscitate a child from moderate sedation, that is the ability to open the airway, suction out secretions with a slightly longer suction into the tube, uh, should be available with a continuous positive airway pressure mask. Or perform a bag valve mask ventilation, insert an oral airway, a nasopharyngeal airway, and a laryngeal mask, rarely perform a tracheal intubation. These aids should be available close by if we are practicing minimal to moderate sedation, mostly moderate sedation. So with that, I believe we come to the end of the overview between hypnosis and sedation in the field of dentistry. So if any of you are interested in um, more in-depth knowledge of the same and a full day's training or you know clinical training also you can feel free to email me or whatsapp me on the number that i'm sharing and you can take down these details and feel free to reach out and uh, from time to time not very often because of the schedule we do have a full day's training program at the hospital and sometimes in different centers so if you are interested in further training you can feel free to reach out thank you so much uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for the informative session. Uh, now I would like to proceed with the Q&A round, ma'am. Should I begin? Uh, sure. Ma'am, what are the contraindications to perform hyposedition on patients? Uh, you mean hypnosedation? Yeah, ma'am. Okay, so um, if, you know, there is a child who has severe psychological or psychiatric impairment or disturbance to the point of psychosis, one should not perform um, mild or moderate hypnosis or sedation. General anesthesia and complete intubation should be given preference. That is one. Second, of course, in, uh, you know, with nitrous um, and different drugs have different uh, contraindications. Hypnosis has one major contraindication that is the inability of the patient to understand. So say I have a three or four year old child with autism and uh, 
you know lack in global developmental delay uh, speech therapy uh, the child is undergoing speech therapy and is not amenable to understanding what i'm saying then hypnosis is bound to fail so i will never choose this patient for hypnosis neither will i choose this case for sedation and nitrous with great caution depending on the activity levels etc we should screen out the patient for the drug this child may respond if it's a small procedure under deep sedation or if it's a full mouth thing then under general anesthesia altogether uh thank you so much ma'am moving towards the next question ma'am what is the prerequisite for a clinician to perform hypnosedation and what courses should we go for okay so i'll um, answer this correctly because i've had to battle through the same journey myself very much because i wanted to take up research and that to in a government hospital and we faced a lot of opposition from the ethics committee the human resources committee and team of doctors to practice hypnosis so not only did i undergo uh, training with psychiatry department but i also did a diploma course in hypnotherapy so that was an 18 month long diploma with the american hypnosis association but um, i think there are a lot of diplomas which are available sometimes for practicing hypnosis in the clinic even a two day course of basic hypnosis should suffice because it will give you good training of basic techniques to work with and these are harmless techniques which are using colors numbers breathing patterns with which you can do no harm but then again patient selection and informed consent should always be practiced that you should have a written consent or a verbal at least informed consent and the patient should be comfortable with you always an attendant or um, you know somebody from your end and the patient should always be present with the child and a child should not be left alone while practicing hypnosis especially male operator female patient and vice versa um, and i think even in the same gender it is always better to have a parental presence in the operatory and um, so i think for practicing dental hypnosis even a two day course will give you good training in the basic aids it entirely depends on interest if one has more interest they can go for the full diploma also and various diplomas are available and the bodies in india and internationally also thank you so much ma'am for all the answers now i would like to thank the founder and ceo of sanodin dr anmol bagaria ma'am co director dr ashish chandra sir and my co host dr akshita gupta I request all the viewers to please like share and subscribe our YouTube channel for getting daily updates and webinar thank you so much all for joining us today thank you ma'am thank you akshita thank you